All right, so this is the guitar of the week. It is a Rickenbacker 360 12 string. Very nice 12. I don't know if it's the greatest 12 ever created, but uh, it is iconic. And this song, Bus Stop, uh, is uh, particularly interesting to me in that um, somewhere on Facebook or Instagram, somewhere somebody said, oh, you ripped off Bus Stop for uh, Flaming Telepaths. I did write the chorus to that, is it any wonder thing. But, and I would say that it does bear a resemblance to that, you know. But it's, it's, it's not that much of a riff off, and it was certainly inadvertent. I didn't, I didn't even think of it, really, to be honest. But, having said that, uh, what about too much time on my hands, huh? Same words! Just say it. Just say it. Song catchers, that's what we are. Anyway, uh, but I love that song, Bus Stop. I loved it when I heard it first time. It was amazing. It, uh, I think it came out after I graduated from high school. So the Regal Tones, I don't think we played it. But we did like the Hollies. And uh, today is Saturday. Okay, I'm doing this vlog on Saturday. I'm not going to edit it until later, but today is Saturday, and today is Teddy Bear's Picnic Day. Teddy Bear's Picnic Day. And that song, Teddy Bear's Picnic, is the first song that I ever actually learned how to sing. Uh, I was in kindergarten, and they had a play called Teddy Bear's Picnic. I think it was, it was 1952, and I believe that Bing Crosby had a hit with it then. You know, it was a children's song, kind of novelty tune. And, uh, and so I learned how to sing that when I was in kindergarten. And to this day, I love that kind of change, those changes that... Uh, Because this here, this is the major lift when you have a minor key. And then you go up to, that's called the major lift. So you could say I lifted this chord progression from, from the Hollies and you'd have a pun. A major lift. It was a major lift for me and everybody else that uses, Tommy Shaw, you name it. We've all done it, the major lift. Ask Adam Neely about this. He will tell you, it's the major lift. Okay, so you're playing, playing a minor key, and then you play. It's in the Reaper, it's in everything. It's the major lift, it's a, it's a great technique, songwriting technique, anyway, so. That's your lesson for today, kids. And now on to the viewer comment bin. Our first question comes from EP. Do any of the soft white underbelly songs relate to Imaginos, or was that not a thing until you became Blue Oyster Cult? Um, yeah, they do relate to Imaginos. Uh, Imaginos existed before there was a soft red underbelly, and as a matter of fact, soft red underbelly is referenced in the upcoming bombs over Germany. Uh, so, yes, they do relate to it. Not all of them, of course, uh, but uh, certainly most of the ones that Sandy wrote. Uh, I'm not sure how Queens Boulevard would fit into there, but. Um, Anyway, let's. This is related to the next uh, question from Adri. A D R I. I'm not sure you know, but the Softwood Underbelly recordings were leaked onto the internet a long time ago. I was wondering if it would be okay for me to remake those songs and release them somehow. What are your thoughts? Okay, so the the. Um, 
longer answer is that how it works is that if a song has been written and is not uh, commercially released, the songwriter has the right to deny uh, anybody from recording those songs. So uh, I could potentially, or uh, Dory Lanier, Alan's widow, could potentially say, no, you can't use them. You can't record them. Okay, you can, well, you, anybody can do anything. You could record them, but you can't try and sell them. Uh, and that's how it, it works. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of the, the recordings because I've actually been listening to them and uh, uh, plan to use some of these recordings in the Imaginos 3 record, which is going to be called Mutant Reformation. So uh, there are some of th those Sandy songs that will be used. Uh, there will be some other Blue Oyster Cult songs, like Are You Ready to Rock and ETI. Uh, but there might be songs from other writers besides Sandy, because, uh, you know, the original plan was for Sandy and me to write all those songs. But Sandy's no longer here, so I'm... Uh, uh, I kind of know what he wanted to do with this thing, so I am working with some other songwriters to uh, try and create something that is uh, that fits into this uh, narrative. Besides the songs that are already, you know, that people already know. So and uh, and so, what I would say is this: if you, Adri, want to do this. Uh, write to me first. I'll put a link to my private email down below. That way you can write to me by email. We don't have to do this on YouTube. And uh, we'll discuss it. Okay? Does that sound like a plan? Finally, Paul Glins. I think it's Glins. I think I pronounced your name wrong the last time. Glins. Paul Glins. I wonder your opinion in general of drum parts being overdubbed. In general, I have no problem with it. I mentioned in a previous vlog that I overdubbed the entire drum part to Hot Rails to Hell on Tyranny Meditation uh, with no guide other than uh, Donald, Donald Rose's rhythm guitar part. And uh, that people love that drum track. I, I like it, I think it's pretty raging. You know, uh, it r certainly matches the raging nature of the whole whole record. So uh, I don't have any problem with it as long as it's done well. You know, I've I've done it in the past. I've done it uh, for other records where I had a reference, uh, 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 a click track or something. And uh, as long as it's done well, you know. Uh, it might fall into that category of studio trickery. Studio trickery has been around since the beginning of recording. In the beginning, it was like people would just keep doing it until they got it right. And then once tape became available, uh, you had stereo recording, which was a whole other thing. And then you had hi-fi recording. and you had splicing. Now, Blue Oyster Cult spliced a lot of stuff, especially when we got uh, into Agents of Fortune era. There was a lot of splices that were would take place. Uh, we would splice better, better takes together. Uh, in 1962, there was a song called Palisades Park, and I covered the flip side of that song uh, a couple vlogs back. And when you hear that recording, it it is at a very fast tempo. Uh, I think about 190 beats per minute. But when it gets to the sax solo in the middle, the tempo jumps up immediately. As soon, uh, right on the downbeat, it jumps up to 210 beats per minute. Now. 
How could that happen? People wouldn't naturally play it like that. There must have been a splice there, and they, they spliced the two things together. So, splicing was another form of studio trickery. Now, overdub is just a further development of that, where you can, where you can just come in and, and fix a little things. The next part of the question, I guess I mostly think the skill of the musician should dictate what is played and doesn't overdubbing make it really difficult or impossible to play the piece live afterward? Okay, so it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to perform this song correctly, you will play it enough times. I mean, you might have to take a break in the middle and you just start... Uh, redoing and redoing and redoing that solo until you get it right, until you get all the little bits right. And and once you've practiced it that many times to get it right, you will be able to play it live. I know this from experience, that overdubbing is not a bad thing. The answer, the, 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 the shorter answer is it depends on how you do it and how, uh, you know, what's the effect? What's the effect you're going for, okay? So, um, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your questions, and um, I will see you next season, if not sooner.